Thanks for the introduction. And I'm going to spend the, the topic is efficient and resilient systems in the cognitive era. And I'm going to try and explain what I mean by that. So I have a bunch of people to, to acknowledge. And I'm not going to go through that. But suffice it to say that we have excellent university collaborators I want to acknowledge first. Among them, Professor Mitra, who's sitting in the audience. Thank you for inviting me. And then a bunch of different people at IBM. Uh, uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is based on research that was funded by one or more DARPA programs. And as a result of being the PI of such large programs, projects, uh, I have to work with researchers from a number of different disciplines, which is very interesting. And also, some of, this, some of the thoughts that I'm going to present today are uh, sponsored by IBM Academy of Technology, of which I'm a member, in the sense that uh, they, they allow me to run workshops and stuff like that and, and file reports with executives, which, which, is, which is kind of important function that we have. Uh, so it, it, I view my current role as a thought leader. In other words, a chief philosopher. <laughs> Uh, it's because at, at, at my age, you know, that's all I can do is think up new ideas and inspire the team. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. And uh, you'll see some things. But before I do, I'll do something unusual, which I never do, is acknowledge some of my teachers, which is a traditional uh, thing from the culture that I come from. But I, the reason I'm particularly interested in acknowledging these three Gentlemen, is that they all have Stanford roots. So given that I'm giving this talk at Stanford, I have to mention Professor Jacob Abraham, uh, with whom I did my master's thesis, uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Bob Rao, uh, who was my PhD co-advisor until he left Illinois and started a startup company, as like many professors do, called Sidrome. And then Professor Ed Davidson, who was my uh, advisor, PhD advisor. Also did a Alexi, yeah, that's true. Um, he's, he was a startup guy. <laughs> and so uh, uh, while at Stanford, that was while he was still at Stanford. Yes, and I should actually also mention Professor Michael Flynn, who was uh, Bob's advisor. And through, through him, I got to uh, you know, work a little bit with Professor Flynn in those days of my doctoral work. And uh, that, that, was, that was very precious. There was, came a point when Bob uh, left Illinois and c came to the, you know, started a startup. There was an option for me to move to Stanford and finish up with Michael Flynn, uh, Dr. Flynn. And Bob really wanted that very, but in the end I copped out because I had to, uh, in that point, uh, do a second uh, qualifying exam at Stanford, which I, thought what was not a good idea since I already passed that at Illinois. <clears throat> so that's my brief history. And then uh, we all have a Stanford in University connection. And all were at UI, UC, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, when I started my graduate studies there. Uh, I have to say a little bit about myself, because I'm sure 95% of the people attending this talk don't even know who the guy this is from IBM. <laughs> so uh, even though I'm a pretty uh, you know, old guy. Uh, so uh, basically, the, I thought uh, I would mention that this is the evolution of Pretty Bose at IBM. Uh, and so I started uh, my IIT uh, Karakpur, uh, my bachelor's, and then joined uh, University of Illinois, master's and PhD. And then uh, uh, my first project was this RISC superscalar project, uh, code named Cheetah, and then America. It's, 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 it's now a famous project, mainly because of John Cock, who uh, I worked with. And Tilak Agarwala, you probably don't know him. He was my, uh, also my hiring manager, because John did, didn't manage people. He just worked with people. <laughs> and many of you, I don't know if you had the, uh, some of you senior, senior people in the audience ever had uh, the uh, opportunity to meet with John, but he was quite a person. And I learned uh, uh, a lot from him, needless to say. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, the first project. And then this bunch of other projects, 
Uh, so 19, um, uh, the next phase was uh, the launching of the power uh, machines, in this, because that started the start of the power superscalar machines. And that is now, in the, we, are, we are doing power 10 now. So I've been associated with the power family of processors ever since. Uh, so there was, there was a period when we looked at uh, the system 390 also. So I've been involved with both power and the mainframe processors. System 390 vector facility. Uh, that was a very powerful and interesting machine. It has had a very sophisticated vectorizing compiler. I worked a little bit on that. Uh, uh, and there, there was this period also when uh, the first wave of AI was upon us. I was having a discussion with, about, with the students in the afternoon about the, that first wave, uh, where part of it was this expert system stuff, where Stanford University had a, had a major contribution through uh, programs like Mycin, but IBM had a product called Expert Systems. Um, systems uh, architecture, ESA or something, where it was a piece of software that you can write expert systems in, so I, I was part of that as well. And then the next phase came uh, where we designed Power 3. Uh, I went to Austin on assignment. That was my product division experience for three years. Uh, so I was a chief performance architect for Power 3 in the process uh, designed and proposed MXU, which is a matrix unit, which is a matrix accelerator, but didn't make it. That's why it's in red. Uh, <laughs> but Power 3 did make it. I started also the culture of PVPs, performance verification programs, because by that time what happened was uh, uh, we found that simulators, architectural simulators, were, could be quite wrong. So in predicting uh, performance. And so performance verification of, of performance modeling uh, frameworks was an open item. So while at Austin in the product mode, I started systematically systematizing the process of generating PVPs so that you gain confidence. So that was now, uh, con uh, 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 since I started it, now a set methodology within IBM, which is good. Uh, and then started the high-end you know, gigahertz domain uh, uh, regime processors within IBM, Power 4, Power 5. Uh, they also unfortunately made me a manager at that time. So ever since then, I have uh, this management burden, uh, which you can see what happens. You bend backward again and uh, with that burden. And we are back to this point. So this started the Power Aware Microarchitecture Group. We started worrying about power as architects at a time where, where nobody was that interested in power awareness. <laughs> but we were seeing something from our modeling that uh, power would become a major constraint. Uh, nobody believed us at that point. But eventually, I think it became very clear. And then later, I added reliability to our charter because I knew that power and reliability were linked. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And then we started dynamic power management, workload-driven power management. Not enough to design a power-efficient processor, but you also have to worry about the, the dynamic properties of applications and how to optimize the scheduling and the inner workings of the processor, power gating and DVFS, how to make sure you manage know how to power. Then we moved on to other stuff with, this is the beginning of my adventure with DARPA, <laughs> unfortunately, because I realized that if we remain just in this mode, it will be just worrying about the short-term product development cycle of IBM. And there will be no room to think ahead about the future, uh, because by this time, what is beginning to happen was the hardware systems market was saturating. and the industry as a whole, especially IBM, was beginning to turn the ship to a different strategic route where software and services was going to dominate. And in particular, 2011 is when the Jeopardy system was demonstrated, the AI, and that started the AI, the second wave of AI, <clears throat> at least within IBM. Life goes on, and I think in the next phase of my career at IBM, I'll be again using the DARPA funding to think ahead about our systems. There's this new paradigm called Swarm AI that I'm very interested in. 
Uh, we also are going to design the next generation exascale supercomputers. So oh, by the way, at IBM, we do, we do build supercomputers. Blue Gene, Q, P, Q, L, all these machines. <laughs> and then the, the next one, uh, the one that, that you might have read about was Summit, which was accepted. Um, you know, there was some press about the Summit machine, and, and then after that, the Sierra machine. So we built two machines under the Coral One program. And the next uh, <coughs> supercomputer, the exascale regime computer is now due, is, go is going to be happening after that, right? Uh, agile hardware design flow and post-CMOS systems. So in a nutshell, robust AI, HPC, and quantum computing are some of the things that we are looking at <coughs> for the future. Rather uh, long preamble, but uh, I think that was important for you to understand a little bit about who I am. And this, this is John, this is Tilak. Uh, I should also acknowledge my <coughs> uh, BTEC advisor. Some of you know uh, uh, Professor P. Das Gupta at IIT Kharagpur, but this was his dad. <laughs> and he was my teacher at that point. Uh, the reason I never have this slide about IBM research, but I'll be very open. We do not get any students or graduates from Stanford <laughs> at IBM TJ Watson in recent years. So I wanted to do one slide of sell selling, but it's still uh, the major industry research lab. It's strong, it's vibrant. We do exciting things. And this is our record. It's not, a, not very bad, not too bad, not too. So just think about us when you, if those, those amongst you who want to do research, advanced research, meaningful research, uh, down, down to earth research. <laughs> At the same time, we think 20, 25 years ahead, we do. But we are still uh, have to monet think about monetization. Uh, we don't do research in the vacuum just for the sake of it. I wish we could, actually. <laughs> we used to be able to do that, but we can't. Okay, the next thing is AI. Today, everybody is doing AI. Even I was, this, this email came in this morning, so I put it in. AI in the ITC International Test Conference Test Week. <laughs> uh, VLSI Design 2019, theme is autonomous intelligence for a safe, secure, and smart world. So it's not just computer architects. I could, I could talk about the architecture year conferences, which is where I go to, not, not necessarily these ones. But everybody is into AI. And so why not us? <clears throat> so that's what, I'm going to next introduce is this new era of computing. This is what has happened. I was mentioning this 2011 uh, uh, time frame when this Jeopardy thing happened, Watson Jeopardy. Before that, there was this rule-based expert systems uh, formalism. And then, you know, that sort of launched these two, this, this sequence kind of launched. There was this deep blue chess machine before that. Uh, launched what we call the cognitive systems era uh, for because AI became a bad word for a number of uh, decades after the first wave kind of failed. So uh, IBM hesitated to use the word AI. Now uh, we are not saying cognitive anymore. We are being pretty open saying it's, this is AI, guys. <laughs> so this, uh, the, this seems real. <laughs> so why is it happening this time? <clears throat> why, why now? What is different this time? Why do we think this is real this time? Because the timing, uh, you know, the data, big data, big data has happened, is, is, is lots of sensors out there, lots of data, therefore opportunity for learning and training and coming up with realistic models, that's one. And then the computing systems have evolved to the point where things are possible. So that in a nutshell is, is, is what's happening as to why this is happening. Now, a word about the title of my uh, department's name, Efficient Resilience. What is Efficient Resilience? Uh, well, system design approach to improve efficiency with guarantees of operational correctness in the late CMOS era. Um, um, as, as, as was introduced earlier, uh, we are in the sort of era where Moore's law is no longer working, <laughs> or sort of not working as well. Uh, we certainly don't talk about Denard scaling rule anymore. Denard is from IBM, by the way. Um, and you know, by the way, I should mention that you know I've worked 35 plus years at IBM, but Denard worked 52 years. 
<laughs> and he still comes. <laughs> so uh, don't write me off yet. I'm going to stay there, hopefully, for a famous last words could be, but I do plan to stay uh, for a while and do exciting stuff. It's still extremely vib vibrant, if you, if, 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 vibrant place. Yes? What is the note burden on your slide? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm going to mention that limitedly uh, next. So the, what, the, the point of this chart of this cartoon is that the power wall and the reliability wall are kind of limited and it's kind of like a vicious circle because in order to circumvent the, the power wall, there's a tendency in modern design to design with tighter margins, uh, such as with you know, lower voltages or, or you know, other, other stringent measures to save power. And then also that results sometimes in higher maximum temperature because you want to skimp on packaging cost, cooling cost. You want to, the cost is always important, right? And so limited or no burn-in, again, to save cost, for those of you who are familiar with, with, with the term burn-in, uh, burn-in is an interesting uh, thing which has been done for, for, for ages by at least by IBM all the time, is a uh, the chips are put into the, literally into an oven. <laughs> Uh, you know, like high, very high temperature and under very stressful conditions. Sort of like a human being stepping onto a stress machine. Uh, work, you know, when you take a stress test, uh, <laughs> similar concept. And if you, are, if you are a weak chip, you'd essentially die. Uh, and then that's the way to eliminate the weak chips. And maybe 3%, 5% of the chips fail. And then the other remaining 95% are strong, deemed to be strong enough, and that you ship them. It's not just high voltage, it's also high, uh, high temperature, but also high voltage, right? So you stress out all the parameters as much as you can, uh, within reason, of course. If you, if you do it too high, everything will burn. So that's the science in itself, how to set the burn-in parameters. And so that's how, uh, uh, you know, the mo moment you do that, though, uh, other bad things sometimes happen. Aging increases because you, you age the things faster, and so you lose margin because of that and so forth. And so all of that leads to uh, a, a more stringent reliability challenge, a reliability wall. And then again, in order to circumvent that, you try to put in more stuff like parity, ECC, robust design, design adjustments, redundancy. All of that, what does it do? Adds more power. So back we go. So this is the, the, the problem that, that we are facing in the late CMOS era from a pure systems, nothing to do with AI yet, but in general, this is the problem, right? Now, cross-layer design is something that Professor Mitra uh, helped us a lot in the, the last DARPA project, which is over now. Using that principle, we were able to show, I think that we were quite successfully, that you can uh, you know, solve this problem. <laughs> and I'll, I'll have more things to say about that later. But this kind of uh, cross-layer optimization is a key enabler for mobile real-time computing, which is, the th which is, the, which is the, my next chart, to try to say to me and to us, many of us at IBM Research, this is really the new system architectural vision for the cognitive era or the AI era. What is that vision? Well, you can't get rid of the cloud, the backend cloud. That's ubiquitous. It's there. It's almost invisible. It's there. Uh, when you use your Apple phone, it's there. The cloud is there, <laughs> right? Uh, but there's a whole bunch of these mobile devices which are springing up, including, of course, uh, the promise of autonomic cars or auto self-driving cars, uh, uh, drones, what have you, right? Watches robots, uh, you know, even glasses, <clears throat> smart glasses. And we envision the future as being the following where all of these devices will be communicating not just with the backend cloud as you have today, but also with each other. Why not? Uh, all the technology exists, so why not have, uh, think about a wireless, ad hoc wireless network which these devices can take advantage of. Case in point, just focus in on the self-driving car market. Today, if you look at the Google car or any you know, company's uh, secret project, they are working with that Google car model in mind. 
very rich sensors, very expensive therefore, connected to the cloud, but not talking to each other. <laughs> this paradigm requires fewer sensors, therefore cheaper cars, but with the ability to talk to each other, and therefore forming what we call a swarm cache of knowledge, where if you are in the need of getting some critical piece of information from the cloud, you first try your neighbor first. <laughs> Somebody who might already have that information. So it is exactly, in architect's term, like a cache. A local cache, lower latency than going to the cloud. So this is our vision of how the future interconnected IoT, cognitive IoT system architecture looks like. Uh, this we call swarm AI. There are many other connotations of this which I'll get to gradually. But some of the things are listed here. Uh, it can deal with unstable or unreliable you know, wireless connectivity because of the redundancy. Uh, there's lots of these devices. So if one fails, you can always count on another. It has resilient system reconfiguration capabilities. So that's about resilience too. And then there are things that you can, you, 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 increasingly you can see happening in each of these edge devices, such as approximation, sampling, filtering, machine learning, acceleration. So you, you, can, you can see each of this, with the progress of time, these smart devices being not just inference engines, but also doing edge-based training or learning. And you can do that better if you swarm with each other. Very analogous to how us human beings, we work together. Not all of us know everything. We are domain experts in different things, but we know how to work together and get a large project down. I'm very used to that in industry because teamwork is very, very critical and not everybody has the same skills. So this, there's a term in AI called transfer knowledge, which is related to this concept, which means if you get a device which is trained in a particular domain, can this quickly learn something else? <laughs> a different domain quickly, rather than getting retrained in the factory with lots of, lots of new data. There are other implications here about cognitive resilience, which I'll get to later. Oh. Yes? Um, to answer your question, could you please consider, last year, Jack Degard definitively said, no, the cloud is not a supercomputer. No, no, that not, but in this context. Yeah. I meant, could a supercomputer be used to do back-end learning? Yes. The of AI. How does that differ from Carl Sims and what he was doing in the 90s with Thinking Machines Corporation? Oh, quite different. I, I think this is this is as you will as I will hint. I don't have you know full detail disclosure in this in this pitch, but this is a paradigm. This is a new AI paradigm where uh, you sort of continuously learn in the field. Uh, thinking machines, connection machines, uh, there were architecturally, you know, machines which could communicate with each other. But that's nothing to do with AI as we know it today, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's a philosophical debate, of course, what, what is AI versus what is not. But in, uh, what, when I mean AI here, I mean, uh, you know, in a narrow sense, machine learning, deep learning. And that's the current state of AI today, if I, want, if I want to, I don't want to overgeneralize, but simplifying way of where AI is today is machine learning, deep learning. Get trained with lots and lots of data, and then apply it, you know, have that model in your brain, and then go solve day-to-day -day problems, right? And there are all sorts of learning networks, but in a nutshell, it's that, right? That's why this has happened. I was, as I was mentioning in that previous slide, this is why is this sudden in the last five years this has happened? Because of availability of lots and lots of data and increase in processing power. No other reason, because neural networks is not a new field. <laughs> it's been there for 50 years, <laughs> right? It's just that the time was, it was before its time. Now it's enabled by big data. 70 years, okay. I won't argue. So there are these uh, needs that we will examine at the edge. The important point for us is what do each of these processes at the edge have to look like? 
how do you have to, how do we de design these embedded devices or processes at the edge to be able to function in this futuristic world? And it's not that futuristic. Every auto company that you're, you're talking to, I mean, there's Toyota right here, uh, Toyota Research, in, in which we are plugged in with, they have a, a project called Collaborative Perception. So we call it Swarm AI. They have a secret project called, not so secret, they publish papers. Uh, <coughs> uh, so it's an open thing. Uh, it's not proprietary or anything, they openly presented it to us, right? So it's, it's you, know, you know, people are inevitably going to think about this. So every auto company has, is thinking uh, uh, something uh, like this, I, I believe. The timing may not be right yet for us to jump straight into this, but that's because the research is not done. Okay, so from swarm intelligence, swarm intelligence as a term is not new either. It's a bio-inspired algorithm which is used primarily for optimization, such as ant colony optimization and particle swarm optimization, but it's an optimization technique very analogous to simulated annealing. It's bio-inspired. But that was the limit of what swarm intelligence was. From swarm intelligence, we want to go to adaptive swarm intelligence, which is what we are doing, where the whole scope is to fix the cognitive resilience issue that the fact that these algorithms tend to be brittle because uh, what happens is that you train it with lots and lots of data, and then in the field, sometimes surprising changes of data patterns happen. As a result, the accuracy performance equals accuracy, classification or inference accuracy, plummets, oops, plummets precipitously. And then in these brittle systems, they don't recover anymore because it doesn't know the new data. Other than sending the device back to the factory to get retrained, there's no solution today. So big open problem in modern AI is how to fix this so that it might take, this is the desired solution, these are all cartoons, that it plummets, the accuracy plummets for a short while, but it picks right back up and goes along. This is what we want, continuous learning in the field. We believe, and there's a DARPA program in which we are not part of, that is tackling this. <clears throat> Hava Siegelman is a program manager. We believe that the adaptive swarm intelligence concept where uh, these, these sort of, what's adaptive about it? There's a new AI pattern that inspired by swarm intelligence principles, but enables a level of cognition that can emerge synergistically from the swarm, but not from individual devices alone. So each of these devices may be pretty dumb in itself, but the swarming helps each of its brains, each of its learning engines to evolve over time, to gain from each other's knowledge. Silly example, suppose a car in California here, not used to New York snow, getting used to autonomic driving here, autonomous driving, is sent to New York. It might not have been trained with the right data to function properly in the snow and ice of New York. So what does it do? You send it back to the factory to get trained or uh, do you get it trained, ideally would like, like it to learn quickly from uh, its New York brothers and sisters, <laughs> right? So that's the promise. I'm not saying that this is, this is, the, this is, the, this, this is one of the examples of uh, motivations, right? So there is a resilience angle is what my point of that was. Oh, by the way, this is a broad paradigm, we believe. It's not just limited to autonomous cars, but it can apply to things like cybersecurity, you know, cybersecurity, uh, network cybersecurity, where a number of different agents sitting, listening in on the, on the network could co cooperate with each other in determining quickly that it's under attack. It could apply more generally to unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, it's almost the same as this, except it's a much more complex problem because there are more degrees of motion. Search and rescue operations using smart drone swarms. 
and the, the obvious military, military connotations in each of these as well. But I'm focusing on the civilian or, 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 or uh, examples. Distributed power management, this is something that we are immediately doing for our next generation processors and data centers. So this is what we do. We get the research, we, we, we get the money to perform, and then we try to apply it as, as immediately as possible to something real. So we'll talk about this a little bit if, if, if there's time. Um, so edge embedded SOC trends, C of accelerators. You all know this, I'm not gonna to spend too much time. The challenges are, uh, so a bunch of different CPU, general purpose cores, GPUs maybe, a bunch of different accelerators, memories. The question is how, what's the design integration? This is, this is, this is apart from, this is in addition to the application level trends. This is in general a problem. How do you take an application domain and quickly synthesize a system, not just a chip, a system on a chip, but a software stack to make it programmable? Because it's no good to have a, just an automated push button methodology which gives you a chip. You want, to be, want it to be programmable. That's, in a nutshell, what the DARPA ERI DSOC domain-specific SOC program is, with Tom Rondo being the program manager, and that's what we one of the, the current DARPA program, which has just been launched, uh, we have started working on. <clears throat> yes? Uh, yes, sure, we'll get to it right away, because even in this thing, picture, um, you know, that uh, I, I painted before, if you take autonomous cars, according to the way this is defined, it roughly covers two domains, computer vision and software radio. <laughs> uh, why is that? Computer vision is obvious. These are intelligent cars have cameras, and you have to process videos. So you have to recognize obstacles, stop signs, yield signs, lane markers. All many smart cars, all of our smart cars today have lane, lane violation signals already. Right? Some rudimentary things are already happening. But this is more than that: is being able to avoid obstacles, avoid pedestrians. There are many, by the way, since you br bring this up, I might as well say it now, many ethical issues. If you have a choice of hitting a pedestrian versus a tree, you want to make sure that, that you hit a tree, not the pedestrian. How do you teach a machine to do that? <laughs> These will come up. So ethical issues, ethical issues in cognitive machines is, a, is a, in an emerging new topic, right? Um, and so, why is the software radio part a domain in there? Because you have to have wireless connectivity and you're dealing with radar and, and radio frequency communication. So therefore, software defined radio is a domain, right? Okay, so that's an example. Uh, you could have just, you can just focus on computer vision. Um, actually, Professor Mark Horowitz, who's also doing this program, API in this program is focusing only on computer vision. I'll talk. I'll talk to that in a, in a second. Uh, but going back to this, uh, this is this is the the strategic alignment with systems. This is not just about the edge. Is my point of this graph. It's also about the cloud, the systems that I talked about. Why? Because this is very important in the uh, post more post Denard era. It is highly possible, is it not? Somebody mentioned that the GF announcement about seven nanometer. <laughs> it is highly possible that the whole cadence, the two year cadence, the tick tock is not gonna happen anymore, right? It's going to come three years, four years, maybe six years, maybe eight years before you ship a new system. How does the IT industry then survive? Because the whole point was that. <laughs> I think, and this is just my view, not, not IBM's, not DARPA's, <laughs> is that the way to keep this market sustained is to, yes, accept the fact that your cadence is increasing, but meanwhile, you supply you know, coherence, coherent accelerator interfaces. You give them an accelerator, domain-specific accelerator, every six months. So you install, you ship the system, you learn your particular customer's workloads, and if you have an agile methodology, which is 
the point about the SOC. You, with a very small team, has to be a small team, has to be a small team, 10 people, 15 people, deliver a custom accelerator or set of accelerators for the customer to choose from, right? Having, le having learned their customer profile. This could be the new business model. Yes. You, uh, so you think that uh, basically architectural microarchitecture can basically solve the problem of Moore's law? Like, I think. Well, I'm painting one solution. This is it. There's no. I'm not asking for a new fab node uh, every six months. Am I? I'm saying, understand your customers' workloads and give them appropriate accelerators to, which must be pluggable. Uh, I think, you know, it's a matter of keeping your customer, I'm giving you very practical, keeping your customer happy for six years instead of two years or eight years. And if you say that your function, and you, you should be able to measure that performance, otherwise it's no point. I mean, instead of shipping a new thing which is saying, I'm going to give you a new system, this is old style, right? Which is 2x the performance every two years, right? That was our old. That's gone. Gone. It's not possible. Look at this, what, what you're saying there in this curve. This is from Stanford. This is John Hennessy's curve. So it has to be true, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is what, there's no, there's room. Right? I mean, it, so this, this, is, this, is, this is one way. I'm just proposing this. This is my hypothesis. Yes. And justify the costs of taping out an advanced technology nodes by like, building a custom chip for a single like a consumer. Like, it's not a single. It has to be a bunch of consumers with similar uh, application characteristics. I'm dividing. Suppose you sell to a hundred thousand customers. Not a not. This is server business, so it's not millions. It's not a cell phone market. <laughs> I'm painting the case for, for the, the case for this mobile market I already made. It's obvious. This is where, but this is, I'm saying, even for the server mainframe market, this is relevant because even if it's 100,000 customers, you cluster them into groups because there are many commonalities. Say airline companies, American Airlines, Continental, whatever, our customers. These are all IBM customers who buy from us, even now. So you study them and give them a solution every six months. So it, it amortizes, I think. I think it does. Uh, if, if, it's, if, if your net customer's base is two, then yeah, it won't work. <laughs> but uh, it has to be something substantial, 100,000 at least. <laughs> then it does work. And by the way, you, 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 you look at it from a customer's point of view, instead of upgrading to a brand new system which is going to cost them a million dollars, if it's an IBM mainframe, you give them something every six months which is $50,000, I think it's a good deal. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm not a business person. I'm a technical person, but I see this very clearly. This is the, what's going to happen. And so therefore, working on projects like DSOC is strategically important for even a company like IBM. So whether it's at the edge or the cloud, this kind of agile methodology of translating an application domain, understanding your customer workload, and synthesizing it down to an accelerator, which you can plug in, it's a good business case. When I presented this point of view to one of the key AI VPs recently, he said, you've got a potential game changer. I support you 110%. So I think I got my answer. <laughs> so anyway, these are the DSOC selected participants. And yes, Professor Mark Hor Horowitz is one of the winners. He's focusing on computer vision. Uh, the Arizona State University, it's a big project with uh, lots of universities and, and, and industries. It's focusing on software-defined radio. Um, Oak Ridge National Lab is focusing on software-defined radio. Uh, we are the only ones who are focusing on two different domains and trying to understand the fundamentals of the problem and to come up with a solution, focusing as a driving application, the autonomous self-driving car, which is 
arguably an interesting hot area, so which is easy for us to get excited about, and the researchers assigned to it, and DARPA. I think Tom Rondo likes this application a lot. Now, this is, again, to, to say, again, more assertively that this is the application domain we are focusing on, autonomous uh, vehicles. And uh, the project name is EPOX, Efficient Programmability of Cognitive Heterogeneous Systems. Uh, and this is a cartoon about how the car, uh, autonomous car business is increasing already. Number of companies investing into autonomous cars is uh, and, 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 and I think this is, this is a fo focus on intelligent connected autonomous vehicles with computer vision and software radio. Uh, those are the two uh, application domains, right? And uh, more details. Uh, uh, this is how the application kind of looked like. The, evidence, uh, the first, one of the first tasks that we are committed to, which we have made very good progress to the point where this application, the first version is already available open source on GitHub, right? If you're interested, I can point you to it. Because we can, we can use all the collaborative in the whole purpose of open source software as well as hardware is to, is to <laughs> amortize the cost and get to lower cost, design things, software and hardware with fewer people. So it has, in the version that we have, we are focusing on right now on the radar, and the DSRC, uh, this is the short range communications kind of uh, digital, digital short range communication module and linked to the you know, millimeter wave radar and imaging, real time consensus and fusion. So fusion uh, is a very big part. If you have multimodal input coming in streaming through, how do you make sense of the two diverse heterogeneous kinds of inputs and, and, and come to a consensus about what you're seeing? First challenge, as I was saying, sensor fusion. Sensor fusion is an important part of this cooperative sensor fusion. And you can apply the principle of swarm intelligence here because on your own, you may be confused. You're getting the camera and the associated intelligence saying this is a stop sign, but the other sensor may be leading you to believe you might be dealing with uh, yield sign, um, silly example, but I'm just saying, is, you know, it could be issues, right? Or pedestrian versus a tree. And so uh, this is where the swarm helps because other cars are seeing the same thing but from a different vantage angle and they may have a richer view in some cases, not all. So if they supply you with that, maybe you can fuse things together and come up with a CRISPR classification. So individually, another way in AI terms is that your own inference engine on its own may be at 89% accuracy, but when you make use of collaborative input from other agents of your kind, you may be able to increase your classification accuracy to 95%, 99%. It's like crowdsourcing, guys. What do you do when you want an answer? How many calories is this hamburger? This program exists as app. Uh, crowdsourcing gives, you know, you can, you can apply this. People have demonstrated this, even with human beings. Same principle. Anyway. So this is more details on how the ERA application is constructed. And we are using this uh, ROS framework to put everything together. That's the first version. I'm not going to go into the, too many details on this one, but except focusing on the hardware, right? Now, this is optimized hardware for embedded AI. Now, you can see there's a footnote here saying, note that the difference, different, that this is not so different from, this, from the specs of a modern high-performance supercomputer, because the individual node there also interestingly enough, has to be extremely low power. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't get to build this entire exascale supercomputer with only a 30 megawatt power limit. You just can't do the math. And so you need to focus on how to build resilient low power devices for a 
whole spectrum of processes from embedded all the way to cloud, as well as supercomputing, large scale supercomputing. Resilience is probably even more important than efficiency for a supercomputer. Why? Because the number of processes is thousands. So if the fit rate is not small enough, your mean time to failure can be seconds or minutes. Easy math, reliability 101. So therefore you can see that focusing on just the embedded domain, evidently you might say, why are you working on embedded processors? Because IBM is not going to do embedded, but no. You need a driving motivation, an application, an exciting one, but the technology that comes out of it applies pervasively to even your core business, right? So that's, that's so it's, the other, other point is that today's cars are moving data centers with onboard sensors and computers that capture real time. This is, this is taken from the IBM uh, webpage on Watson applied to IoT. So there is actually an IoT automotive division of Watson. So we do take this domain very seriously. How we offer the solution, this is actually a new business opportunity that I would like to create in an entrepreneurial mode. We would like our research team to actually, like years ago we went, we did this, some of us, in entering the game market. Believe it or not, at some point, all the game processes were from IBM. <laughs> the Sony Xbox, the Nintendo, as well as Apple, right? All the game processors were from IBM. We had to move out from that because we couldn't deliver the, the low power because we really want to cater to our high performance, high power. That is our bread and butter, right? But if you could develop technology which does high performance and energy efficiency together, low power as well as high performance, then that would be very good for us. <laughs> applies to edge, applies to basic fundamental technology to servers. So this term called wide operating range pro processors refers to what I say, something that is designed to operate across a range of voltage frequencies, not just one volt and you know, four gigahertz, which is our high end server design point approximately. Uh, Z systems are actually higher frequency, like six. But we want the same processor to be operate quite efficiently all the way down to 0 0.5, 0 0.4, maybe even 0.3, why not? So if you combine low voltage technology with specialized acceleration, then you have it. Then you can get to levels of performance per watt, whatever metric you want to use. If you're in the AI domain, then you would use the term nanojoules per prediction, nanojoules per inference. That's throughput performance per watt <laughs> for your domain. You can get to that. Remember, years ago, the first heterogeneous commercial processor was from IBM. This was the cell processor, which powered game systems from Sony and others. At the same time, it powered supercomputers. It was the number one on the supercomputing list. Same processor, same concept, wide operating range, except that we didn't know how to go to really low voltages. <laughs> Today, there's a need to, to go to really low voltages also. And that's a, a lot of this, we did work under the DARPA Perfect project. So here is a sampling of the chips that we put out under the DARPA Perfect project. Um, Surprisingly and, and nicely, all of the chips that we have taped out work. These are from Harvard, uh, and th this is from IBM, and this is from IBM and University of Virginia together. A lot of test chips before that. One of the key things here is how to make SRAMs work at really low voltages, because if those of you with circuits background know that, that the fundamental reasons you can't go to very low voltage is that the SRAMs don't work. So naturally, we focused a lot of uh, research and test chips that showed how to make SRAMs work at as low as 0.25 volts in, for us. So that's what has gone into these processors. And this one is just back from the fab and the initial tests are showing that it works, which is good. 
we should be able to get the full analysis done soon so that we submit it somewhere. And this is not yet back for the fab. Yes? These 0.3-year-old SRAMs, does that hurt their latency? Go down to it that does. voltage? How it much? Does. It does. Uh, there, are, there are equations, there are curves that we, we, can, we can show later. Uh, but yes. Is that is an order of magnitude? Oh, well, it's, it's not that hard to co compute, right? It, in that range, roughly voltage and frequency are linear. So if you go down from what is your starting point, one volt to 0.3 volts, you get frequency, uh, you know, hit of that same ratio, approximately. Yes. But remember, <coughs> the whole concept is about throughput per performance. So if you have lots of little cores with low voltage, then, and if your application, many ifs, is a lot of parallelism in it, then you can't lose with that. Throughput per performance, per, throughput per watt will be very high using that paradigm. This is well known. So I didn't devote a slide to that. It's obvious if you have a small serial component, your Amdahl's component is small, if you have lots of parallelism, then going to low voltage, and many of these applications are like that. When you offload to the accelerator, it's embarrassingly parallel. After all, the heart of this deep learning, machine learning thing is matrix multiplication and vector <laughs> stuff, which is embarrassingly parallel. So yes, going to low voltage and frequency helps if you have lots of these cores. Uh, so this can beat a GPU. Yes, uh, this discussion came up. So uh, this is the paradigm to, to beat a GPU. And, but, but of course, the GPU, if you, if you try to make it at lower voltage, it would benefit too. <laughs> and we have tried that also in the course of this research. I, I think I have a slide. This is tools that came out of the perfect thing. And, and again, I wanted to just show that so that you know, the contribution of the Stanford team under Professor Mitra has highlighted the cross the clear methodologies. At least Professor Mitra's students know about this very well. Uh, but the basic concept of how to optimize voltage for a given application is an interesting one because, again, SRAMs you know, stop working after a while. Uh, so you know, how, do you, you know, how do you design the, the optimal voltage? Uh, maybe can, can, you, can you even go, there's a circuit v -min, but can you go even below by exploiting what we call application-level resilience? Okay, this is this is this is something we you wouldn't I wouldn't try it on my bank software, <laughs> but for image processing intensive applications where bit flips don't mean as much, we actually tried this to see even if some amount of the SRAM bits are flipping because of lower voltage low voltage errors, does it affect the ultimately end edge classification? And the answer is surprisingly, but maybe not so surprisingly, that it has a large amount of tolerance. You can go down even below the circuit VMIM of 0.3 volts or whatever you, you came up with. Yes? Well, that makes sense for stuff like data, but I imagine having inputs. Your instruction pointer is a. This is data. I'm talking about data, <laughs> not control. But suppose, I'll give you a simple example. This is the chip that we built. I mean, I'm going to talk to this in a couple of slides. Uh, I know we are at the end of this, my time, though, so I have to finish up real fast. But let me just go to that. So uh, let me just spend a minute here to ex explain the chips that we built from Harvard. And this, they also exploited application re level resilience uh, uh, to get to this level of efficiency. But they didn't use low voltage SRAMs. They relied completely on application level resilience to get to the level of uh, you know, efficiency that they could demonstrate. Uh, for, for us, before, while we were taping out the chips, we also did a project in, in aggressive undervolting of GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs as they currently stand. There's a big opportunity we showed, 20% uh, lower voltage. Uh, I also wanted to highlight this uh, complex voltage control loops that we already did. I was part of the team which did this complex control flow to do adaptive guard banding, which means essentially operating uh, uh, near the edge, <laughs> uh, so that only occasionally when you're, when you're on the edge, you have these scannery circuits which tell you, 
and then you do something like throttle your frequency. That's the basic concept. Lots, this is actually shipped in real products, Power 7, as way back as Power 7, but we try to apply a different set of techniques <coughs> in our test chips. And in, in for the GPU case, um, we can't control the GPU because it's from NVIDIA. We do use NVIDIA GPUs in our systems, as, as you know. <clears throat> but we, we have talked to them often about, you know, there's opportunity that they're leaving on the table in terms of efficiency. Let's see where this goes. But we did extensive experiments with commercial GPUs, lots of them, <clears throat> not just one board, uh, to come up with data which shows that you could do aggressive uh, undervolting. Yes, there was a point where beyond which you get silent data corruption and you get CUDA uh, runtime error seg fault, uh, but there's a large, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can do things like, you know, go beyond the, the circuit vmin. And we even proposed a, uh, a, a counter-based methodology of predicting the onset of a voltage droop, so which is an interesting thing. Uh, you can predict that uh, this voltage droop is going to happen and so predictively try to uh, raise your, freq um, sorry, your voltage <laughs> or lower your frequency to cope with that. Similar to the canary circuits that we had on Power 7, but this is a completely different uh, digital kind of means to doing that. Okay, so uh, the concept is, is the same. Now I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, but we did with this kind of with statistical modeling of errors in memory. Uh, we did fault injection experiments uh, for uh, classical neural network, kind of artificial neural network topologies of various kinds to understand the limits of resilience of these applications. So I'll just leave it at that. And then some of that thinking went into this chip, which was taped out on its back and it's working, I was mentioning, called Dante. Uh, we used the boosted SRAM technology from Ra Dr. Rajiv Joshi and our team, uh, and, his, and his team, um, uh, to get to really low voltage SRAMs. And uh, this is, in this case, 6T SRAM even, commercial, easily available 6T SRAM with all the fabs having compilers for 6T SRAM. Uh, we added the boost circuitry manually, of course. Um, there's thought of packaging this up as an usable library for GF if they're interested. Of course, they may not be anymore, but, <laughs> but uh, then this chip was taped out and we have a working chip, uh, but we don't have the full results yet. Uh, it will come in a month or two. Uh, these are, this is some sampling of the results that we already have. Uh, this is applying MNIST versus uh, this uh, AlexNet and showing the energy performance trade-offs. Performance here means accuracy. So you can obviously, uh, as you go to higher voltages, get to higher levels of accuracy, but even if you drop the voltage, but you add the selective boosting of SRAMs, those are you know, different voltage levels of the boost, you can uh, then stick to a very low vo supply voltage and still get to very high levels of uh, classification accuracy. So that's what um, the measurements are showing, and so we are very happy about that. Now, I'll quickly wrap up, I promise, in five minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry for extending. Uh, but this is, I have to say a few things about DSOC, and it's a nutshell, these are the core um, key focus areas. Uh, so one of them, uh, as you can see, is this interesting ontology thing, which uh, Dr. Rondo, the program manager, really likes as part of his program. He, this, what this means is that, and this just should appeal to the design automation community in general, uh, given an application, is there a science or systematic way in which you can argue these are the right primitives for which you should build accelerators? In a nutshell, that's the problem. In some sense, and it's not just one application, of course, it's a, it's a number of applications representing a domain. So if you're saying computer vision, it's not one application program, it's several. <laughs> and you have to analyze that and say, what are the right primitives which cover? So you see, I use the term cover, it's a covering problem. What's the right set of primitives? And all of you working in design automation know the, the famous, the covering problem. This is the, this is the place of Dr. McCluskey, right? <laughs> Quinn McCluskey algorithm, right? So covering problem how to use the prime implicants to cover a function. Same problem here, except 
you have to do it, solve it. Never been done before. So that's what this team is working on, uh, coupled with the compiler, because the compiler has to be in the loop. This is the open source compiler and programming model. This is the Illinois uh, contribution to the project, is the open source compiler, uh, uh, which is LLVM, used, uh, but now the, they have new abstraction called HPVM, hyper, hyper, uh, sorry, heterogeneous parallel virtual machine. And so it's able to generate graphs as an intermediate representation as opposed to a linear IR as in LLVM. And then you can process that to do ontological analysis, et cetera, right? So the compiler is in the loop from the get-go to try to solve this ontological problem. Then there's agile uh, design flow. IBM and Columbia and Harvard are in it together. And then there's interesting distributed swarm resource management. Uh, so this whole principle of swarm AI, we don't want it to apply just to the larger system level, but also to the chip, how to manage power in a distributed manner with lots of cores in a, instead of having a centralized resource. So let me just skip the, the, the hardware uh, things for a minute and focus on that. This is the last couple of slides saying distributed power management. How do you do distributed power management for a many core uh, processor, SOC? Uh, so previous design, today's designs, both Intel, IBM, AMD, all of them have an on-chip power manager, which is a centralized bottlenecks resource. It does not scale. As you go to the many core paradigm, that's not gonna scale. It's going to be the performance bottleneck <laughs> because you have to do sense and actuate. And if you have many number of cores, you, that latency is so much that your performance suffers, becomes the gate. So you need to distribute this, this is obvious. Now, how do you distribute that? We are trying an aggressive approach, saying extreme total distribution. No centralized resource involved, hardware. So these cores talk to each other, <laughs> exchange power information and applications and power state information and collaboratively distribute power tokens, fixed number of tokens because of a fixed power budget, 100 tokens, let us say. How do you distribute this 100 tokens within yourselves to be able to maximize, what's the objective function? Throughput, of course. Within a power budget, how do you maximize throughput? And therefore, throughput for what? So that's the thing that we implemented. I'm not going to go into details uh, of the algorithm, but you know, visually, this is one cartoon to show that it works. <laughs> it's a you know, simulation uh, that it, basically what it means is that this is power tokens, a fixed number of power tokens. This is without any distributed power manager uh, enabled. This is with the distributed power manager enabled. And uh, you know, basically the darker colors mean that there, there are uh, these short token shortfalls where some, somebody is starving because you, you took away too many power tokens as a result of this game. Whereas this distributed algorithm that we have uh, shows a much better uh, picture where, uh, because if you have shortfall of tokens, that means your performance is throttled, so your throughput across these cores is starved. And so this is just, a, 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 I didn't have time to go through the exact algorithm. There was a chart on that. But in summary, I, I do need to finish. <laughs> uh, these messages that the, the need for SOC specialization is increasing, but costs are prohibitive and increasing as well. Um, uh, a new approach is uh, to realizing novel heterogeneous architectures is needed. Programmability, efficiency, modularity, scalability are the key system design focus areas for us in this project. Energy efficiency under resilience constraints um, uh, always comes up in these situations because you need to make it work first and then argue about energy efficiency, so that's a constraint. And this is where leveraging our DARPA perfect program artifacts is going to help us. The EPOC's goal is to improve cognitive IoT efficiency at the edge by 100x within five to seven years. Uh, the super domain that we have chosen for us is intelligent communicating autonomous vehicles, which, are, which is a combination of two domains, computer vision and software-defined radio. Uh, key innovation areas, uh, I talked about the decentralized hardware control assist to support intelligent 
uh, OS, oh, I didn't talk about the OS task scheduler, but the moment you have this distributed SWARM power manager in the hardware, it needs to be supported by a, by a smart operating system task scheduler, which knows how to schedule um, uh, with this thing underneath, right? And so that's what that is. And then retargetable adaptive compiler, talked about this briefly. Uh, formalism for workload analysis, the ontological framework to figure out uh, the right accelerators to build. There's also, I didn't talk about, but coherent shared memory support to ease programmability for these heterogeneous chips of the future. I talked about, I didn't talk about GAL's Mac layer, uh, but there, that is uh, one of the things with autonomous resource power management. Um, design ecosystem supporting wide operating range. I talked about that a little bit, the concept wise. Uh, heterogeneous SOC is scalable from 25 watts down to 5 watts. That's what the wide operating range uh, functionality buys you. Uh, this is a DARPA mandate at 25 watts to and a 5 watt. These are numbers given by DARPA. Um, open source agile hardware design flow for, e for quick system synthesis. I mentioned the motivation from our point of view for doing that, that if you can supply accelerators to your customer base, quickly with small teams. Uh, that's going to be the new business model according to me. Uh, leverages prior IP library, uh, very low voltage SRAM and associated DNN accelerators developed under the DARPA Perfect. So we already have a rich uh, library of IPs created. So this really supports the agile flow and uh, you know, that we are after because we don't have to design things from scratch. Uh, there's a whole library of open source hardware that we have created. So with that, I'm ready to take any questions if the chairman allows. <laughs> uh, what would be the uh, potential challenges in managing the swarm network like the top network that consists of heterogeneous massive massive parallel applications? Uh, and we'll find details in the solution for it. What are the challenges and solution strategies for the SWARM, the ad hoc network with unreliable wireless things, et cetera? Good question. We don't, I wish I had the answer to everything yet, but this is why we have just started. But this is a, I gave you a concept pitch. But let me s say the following. We have years and years of experience with building resilient mainframe and server processors, right? In a multi-core setting, we know when a core fails, unknown to the user, how that core state is transplanted from one core to another core in the system without the user batting an eyelid, knowing, knowing what happened. <laughs> we have perfected that for the last 20, 25 years. So trans, th it, this is, to me, similar. If something is unreliable, goes down, whatever, we have a way of doing cooperative computation in that environment. We know how to do that uh, using software and hardware. Uh, so that's my brief answer of my first idea on how to do that. OK. Yes. Any other question I might try? This is Stanford University. I mean, I, uh, I don't think I can deal with all of your brightness. It's awesome, but <laughs> yes, there's a. Auto, so is that starting out, ninety-five percent of the cars in your environment are not are not not smart at communicating, and none of the trees are. <laughs> none of the trees are. <laughs> but uh, that's an interesting thought. But what companies are banking on is. Uh, you know, these cameras that are ubiquitous yeah. everywhere, doesn't have to be trees, but you know, posts, mm -hmm. uh, they can form part of the input, right? Yeah. Uh, so so th they are there, and they are already being used. Many of these IP towers, cell phone towers, mm -hmm. are used for programs like Waze. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about Waze, by the way, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a collaborative swarm thing where the human beings are I inputting data <laughs> so that other uh, people, other users benefit. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, in some sense, I'm trying to automate that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, think, I think there's a proof point that it works. How many people in the room use Waze? I use. 
I mean, I mean, so this is a smart GPS uh, algorithm compared to, I mean, and if you think about it, it's collaborative perception or swarm AI, if I want to use a buzzword, but it's, a, it's about collaboratively computing uh, in an altruistic manner uh, uh, to help everybody. <laughs> uh, yes? These hardware efficiencies are nice, but they're not going to be earth shattering, I'm afraid. Well, give us maybe another factor of 10. But we are faced with a horrendous software problem. Yes. We are now going to construct the most complex software that has ever been attempted. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting thought point. So uh, there was a project within IBM which I supported very strongly coming out of our Indus, in, uh, India Research Lab. It just talk about dynamic bloat detection and reduction. Interesting concept, where it's recognizing that due to years and years of software bloat, where the software developers have taken advantage of very fast hardware that we engineers have produced, <laughs> have been very lax in software. I hope I'm not offending some software people here, but the question is, can some, some of these extra transistors <laughs> that might still be available, but not I mean, how to use them to do things like dynamic bloat detection software to try to not do unnecessary computation. Yes. Yeah, this was a famous <clears throat> IBM project in competition with Microsoft. They're building an operating system, and some managers decide, well, yeah. we'll pay programmers for the number of lines of code that they produce. Correct. <laughs> this did not work it's out. Does not well. work out well. <laughs> <laughs> because then they ended up having special bonuses for taking out lines of code. Right. Right. <laughs> Humor me for one minute, one more minute, because I want to share with you this philosophical future research vision. Uh, oh, so why should you add a... <laughs> because I, I, I do want to tell you the secret thing that uh, I want to spill the beans a little bit. Uh, that I think I was discussing this with some of the students. We need to go beyond AI, as we know it. We need to look at what consciousness is, and see if we can build self-aware systems. Truly thinking machines, not, of the, not just saying thinking machines, but something with a machine which can recognize. So what is the hard problem of consciousness? So for those of you philosophers amongst you, it's the hard problem is how does a machine like this have this first person subjective experience where I can say, I, Pradeep Bose. I. Where is this I coming from? How is this I feeling generated? Uh, that's the problem, I think, is, is, is waiting for computer scientists, AI scientists, neuromorphic scientists to try to finally grapple. Yes? Why do you think you think it's important? Very good question. I, I was hoping you would ask that question. Why do you think it is important? I, I'll, I'll give you my answer. I was mentioning peripherally there's these ethical questions. It's given a pedestrian versus a tree, which do I hit? I don't want this to be programmed artificially. I want this uh, for a system to figure out automatically. Saying obviously I hit the tree. <laughs> so ethical issues. This is a big subject if you Google ethics in cognitive computing or AI computing is a big enable this? Why, why wouldn't consciousness enable the opposite, where, where the car goes towards the person? It could, if it, I mean, there are, there are villains amongst human beings also, but <laughs> who would deliberately do it. But there, there's this fundamental principle, of course, and that's where this cloud thing is very important, how you program this cloud. Because you have to use that judiciously. This is the ubiquitous kind of cloud, which is in some sense projecting this, this universe. Uh, of swarm agents. So if this becomes extremely important, which I like because I work for IBM and the cloud is important. So this is, becomes a very important piece of how you program that. But you don't have to worry so much about how these are programmed because these, these are very dependent on that. So continuous learning happens because the latest knowledge gets pushed down here periodically and to keep things clean, right? So that's the new model that I have in mind where, you know, if you think of it this way, this is this, is a, this is this wireless network has all the knowledge in it. 
here in the swarm cache as well as th through this uh, you know, cloud to swarm connectivity, there's a lot of information, hopefully good information. <laughs> and so these are just receivers. Think of it as radios in a, a, a universe where there are lots of radio waves. And uh, if I can make the radio be more human-like or <laughs> self-aware, then it can do better things with the information which is already there. Yes, I have to take pains to make sure that that information is not tainted. Yes, there are security issues, and there are, but, but if I can safeguard that, then now I have created a world where uh, this game of self-aware, conscious, call it artificial consciousness, if you like, I'm, or super AI, if you like, but you really have to go beyond what we t normally called AI. Anyway, okay, let's, that's, let's, that's, let's, that's, let's, that's let's, it. Let's, <laughs>